thank you so much and let's kick it off um so i think um what we've seen in the past years and doesn't come as a surprise to any of us here in the um in in this call is that um fake news or rumors are um um a, a problem that is um ever increasing in recent years right so we have an example from the past in the 30s um there was um fake news still um spreading through newspapers but in recent times it's um more through social media um and i think the most prominent topic or the, the, the first real example in the past years was during the presidential election in the us in 2016 and now during COVID, there was a lot of discussion around fake news as well. Um, and this problem of fake news is um, becoming more and more prevalent because um, A, it is spreading really fast and B, the fact checking is typically taking a lot longer than the, um, than, um, the spreading of the actual fake news. And as we, um, there were multiple studies on this topic but for instance, one thing that I find really interesting is that from the 2016 election, um, citizens on average still remember at least one um, fabricated story um, and they believe it to be true. So this is, um, as I said, a, a, a problem. And what we are trying to do is basically not talking about the content of the, um, of the rumors, but rather look at how they spread on social media. And why do we want to do that? We are looking at the single cascade, not the rumor, how it spread over multiple tweets, but really one tweet and then how um, others retweet and share this information. And why do we want to focus on this particular problem? A, um, observing those single information cascades is really trivial, right? So you can just see them directly on Twitter. You see a tweet and then you see how others react to these tweets. And then basically, connecting different tweet cascades is rather challenging because then you basically need some way to identify different tweets and link them to the same rumor. So the question is really based on a single cascade be, um, consisting of a tweet and a number of retweets, can we identify whether that tweet belongs to a false rumor that is spreading online. Um, as some of you may know, there is um, there has been extensive research on um, these topics. Uh, it began with uh, structural properties of such um, rumor diffusion processes and describing these um, retweet cascades. There were a lot of descriptive studies in the beginning, um, analyzing the in and out degrees of such networks, the depth and the size of those cascades and the diffusion speed. And I, I think most prominently in recent year, there was also a science paper looking at the statistical uh, differences between um, um, room fa false and true rumors. Um, on cascade models, um, there are a lot of models that focus on aggregate statistics. So summarizing a single um, cascade into um, a, a set of features such as the size, the depth, um, the number of followers and so forth. Um, and also um, more generative models um, on veracity detection. So saying whether retweet um, cascade belongs to a true or false rumor. So there's also been some work mostly focusing on the content of the tweets um, being spread, right? But to the best of our knowledge so far, there hasn't been much work um, on looking at the spreading behavior and um, connecting that to the veracity of the rumor. When we look at how um, we want to develop the model, um, we first take a step back and look at an example of such a retweeting behavior and look at the different um, information that we can gain from it, right? So this is basically such a tree that we would look at. We see the root tweet, which is colored in blue, and then subsequent retweets, which again can also be retweeted, right? So every gray bubble is, uh, is a retweet. Um, so we get a number of retweets. Um, we get for each of the, such retweets, we get user information such as the number of followers or how much time it took the, the user to respond, 
um, and so forth. Um, some content information would theoretically be also available, although we don't um, focus um, on this in uh, in this work. But obviously, you have the main tweet. You can see, um, you can analyze which topic the tweet is talking about, what the emotions are um, associated with um, um, with the tweet, and so forth. You have structural information. I already talked about a few of those. So something like the elapsed time. So at which point in time was um, the tweet retweeted? Um, what is the depth um, of, of that retweet? So like how far away from the retweet are you? And then finally, but not shown here, but of interest for our model is the veracity. So whether this, um, what the, the, the tweet is talking about, is that actually a true or a false rumor? Um, so this tree that we looked um, at can be actually translated to um, into a point process. I think I just, no, I didn't skip or, or something here. So we see a cascade on the left, right? It's like a very uh, simplified one. Um, and we can actually um, basically translate that into a point process, having um, um, a, an intensity function lambda of um, t and uh, a counting measure, n of t, which essentially counts the number of retweets over time. And you can basically see how um, both n of t and lambda of t can be derived from this uh, simple tree on the left by uh, considering the bottom graph. So basically, this is the first step translating this review, uh, this retweet cascade into such point processes. Um, point process and then the, the relevant measures here. Um, a point process is basically just a, a collection of random points or events over a continuous time period. And such a point process can be uniquely ca characterized by a counting measure, n of t, as we've seen above. This is essentially just a counting, counting the number of events up to a given time t. And then um, based on that counting measure, you can define an intensity function lambda of t which essentially looks um, the, at the likelihood of, of an event in a small time interval uh, um, at t, right? It's basically the derivative of um, the counting measure. So there is uh, there uh, exists like a number of different point processes out there and the way to formalize this intensity function, but based on what we know or in, intuitively know about um, retweet, uh, retweet dynamics, we can um, formulate three main requirements that our um, point process would need to um, fulfill. So the first one is uh, obviously it has to be variable over time, right? So it can't be constant over time. You can't have like the same likelihood of a new retweet happening um, over time. And over time, it should decrease. I think this is intuitively clear, right? So, I mean, if a tweet is a couple of days old, there's a, like a very low chance that someone will retweet it. Um, then the second one, it should be dependent on prior events. So actually when a tweet is retweeted, I intuitively expect more retweets to happen than if the original tweet wouldn't have been retweeted just by, because the, the tweet, the original tweet would have been exposed to, to more people in the social network. And then three, we would want some sort of event heterogeneity, right? So because um, again, it should make a difference if I retweet something or if uh, Elon Musk retweets something. I think this is also um, immediately clear just because um, the others have a much larger following than I have, um, or they um, their user group, people that follow that follow that user are more homogeneous in some sort and are more likely to retweet something that the, the user shares than um, people that follow me, for instance. So these are three basic requirements that we need our uh, point process to, to follow. So, and um, this gives, um, if, you, if you search long enough, that you come across so-called Hawks processes. Um, and here you see the formulation um, of a Hawks process um, or more or less the intensity function of such a Hawks process. So you have the intensity function is um, equal to 
a constant mu. So you have like always like a, a base chance of something happening. And then you basically have uh, the sum of all past events up to T. And um, there you have a marked so-called marked memory kernel, which modulates the effect of an event or a retweet. So intuitively, um, we can see how all three requirements are met looking at this function. So we first see that this marked memory kernel depends um, on time, and we will see how um, this is actually taken, uh, or how T is used in that uh, memory kernel. Um, it is dependent on prior events. So TI is the, um, the, the event time of prior events. And then you have event heterogeneity. So each kernel depends also on um, the, the differences in the event. And then last but not least, we're not considering mu, uh, mu. So we say all tweets, there's no chance that um, the tweet is just randomly retweeted. It's always due to a prior retweet or the tweet itself, which is um, clear because um, either the tweet triggers the retweet or another retweet, but it can't just randomly happen because you wouldn't need the original tweet. So mu doesn't exist in our consideration. So we, we have um, now we have these um, the smart memory kernels, and um, we decompose that into event dependent mark, so which controls the branching. So how many children does a, a retreat produce, and the baseline memory kernel phi zero, and this phi zero that will be be constant across just from and it, um, retweet to retweet is depending on both user characteristics and um, other factors that we will talk about in a minute. This baseline memory kernel, so um, phi zero, um, that's just a normalized positive function and um, essentially models how fast events are forgotten, right? Um, here we uh, use the power law kernel for the non root and the viable kernel for the root tweets. We will see in a minute that there's actually a difference whether um, the tweet was a root tweet or a simple retweet. And then the branching for, uh, factor or the mark MI is um, simply modeled as a log linear uh, model, which um, models the expected number of children events. So like how many retweets do I expect? And um, there are different, uh, different variables considered here, such as the number of followers, um, that elapsed time and so forth. We'll look at that in a, in a minute. So here's just an example as to why there is a difference in um, in, in the activation function for root versus non-root um, tweets. So for root tweets, we see actually a, a nice Bible-like um, distribution. And for non-root tweets, um, we see a power law. Um, keep in mind the y-axis is different between um, the two graphs. On the left side is the density, on the right side is log density. And this difference is not new, right? So this difference has been observed in other information cascades, so for discussion forums, and the, also the power law behavior um, has been observed in other contexts as well. Um, just a quick overview of the features that we're looking at to, to model the mark. So we're looking at the number of followers, obviously, number of followees, account age, user engagements, how active are the users. Um, we're looking at some, some content-specific information, so just positive, negative emotions expressed in reaction to the root tweet and the topic of the root tweet, and then some, um, uh, some structural information, though actually D is not correct here, it's the depth of the retweet relative to the root, so how far deep into the cascade am I? Uh, the elapsed time since the root tweet. So is it like still early days or um, is this tweet a couple of days old? And um, then the response time <coughs> to the parent tweets. So how, how fast did I retweet um, the parent tweet? Um, so how do we tie this into, how do we use this information um, to detect the veracity? Um, Basically, the, the idea is we already know that the information or the diffusion process for false and rumor, uh, true rumors are different. So what we essentially do is we, we take the same model 
and fit it once on only true cascades and once on also false cascades. And then for a new cascade that we want to test, we basically run it through the, the one model and then through the other model and then check for which of the two models or which of the two models gives a higher likelihood and then assign the veracity label based, um, based on the higher likelihood. So this is how we get basically from the model to the veracity label that we predict. So sorry to interrupt, but we need to wrap this up very soon due to time okay. reasons. Okay, cool. Yeah, then let me just give a quick overview. Um, this you can find in the uh, in the paper if you're interested. It's basically we are using um, the same uh, data source as the paper we cite below. So that's the that's the science the science paper that I mentioned before. Um, and we can see actually that we find um, significant difference in the spreading behavior between uh, true and um, and false um, rumors, as we would expect. Um, this is just an overview. We benchmarked it against uh, a lot of other um, models we looked at early time. Um, just one check, uh, one thing we uh, wanted to show is basically we we run a lot of um, analysis to make sure that our model actually captures the, the essence of the spreading process. I run like a couple of typical Bayesian analysis. Um, we looked at the trace plots, gamma and Rubin conversion index and so forth, look all very good. Then we ran a number of statistical tests for the residual analysis to make sure that it's actually that our point process models the data nicely enough. And then the last step we did is posterior predictive checks. So if anyone is familiar with Bayesian modeling, this is no surprise to them. What we basically did is after we fitted our models, we sampled from them and generated new cascades and um, then looked at what how did like different summary statistics um, behave in uh, or look in comparison to the actual observed ones. And we can actually see that the generated cascades that we produce based on these models uh, essentially produced believable cascades that we also see in the real data set. So they give us like um, a good confirmation that the model fits the data rather well. Um, conclusion, yes. Um, so it's a better understanding of rumor spreading in social media. We see that there's information in the cascades themselves. And now the next step would be to bring it together with other um, sources of information such as, such as stance detection and then also um, text mining. Good, pause here. Okay, thank you for the interesting presentation. We have one question in the chat that I'm going to read and they ask for a short answer. Did you consider any interaction event types on Twitter other than retweets, such as replies, quotes, uh, followers versus non follow retweets, getting ratioed, et cetera? Some of these events seem like they would help in characterizing fake news. Yes, uh, to make no, we haven't. But yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. I think there's uh, there's still work to be done. But in this very first step, we looked at only the the retweets themselves. Okay, thank you again for the presentation.